network at all. There's no way 400 people sound like this. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is David Blaine Edelman. I am the technical evangelist for a company called AppSera. And you and I are going to have a lovely time for the next half an hour. Those of you who are staring into your laptops, I promise you're missing a lot. You might want to look up every now and then. You're really going to get into this. So um, what I want to do is I want to give you a talk, but one of the things that I hate the most about certain talks is when somebody stands up and says, I'm going to give you a tech talk, but they give you a marketing talk. I cannot stand talks like that. Can you raise your hand if you dislike that? Yeah, me too. So now here's the problem with Quandary I have. I will want to mention some things that are related to my company as sort of the assistance group. So here's what I propose to do. You tell me if this works for you. If it doesn't work for you, that's fine. I have these three wooden blocks that I showed my son uh, a while back. What I propose to do is to say no more than these many things that sound anything like marketing. Okay, and for each one of the times I say this, I can take a block away. And so you're going to know at any one time just where we are in that quota. Are you cool with that? Is that one for you? Yes? Are you all down with that? Okay, great. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to break here. Okay? The red block, the yellow block, the blue block. Okay, so let's move on. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the end. I want to hit you with the punchline to give you the basic idea first, and then we're going to work our way backwards. So here's the thing. Production environments, in my opinion, are all about trust, right? They're all about can you tell whether or not, you know, what is running in your production environment? What does every workload contain? You want to also know, like, what resources can a workload consume? So if you're like, say, in, in some sort of cloud provider, you know, that's real money on the line. So you really have to know at any one time what sort of resources are allowed. The other thing that's also really kind of important is where can that workload run? Is it important that that workload is running in your high memory machine? Is it important that that workload never be speeded? If you have some sort of data protection law that you have to pay attention to. Or, you know, sky or something like that, right? And then finally, I think perhaps the most important thing that I think I want to say is who can the workload talk to? Right? Who, you know, it, if it is the case that you have something running and its job is to simply do some processing going away and go away, if it is suddenly talking to something else on the back, that's a big bad thing. That's, that's usually considered bad, at least from my perspective. So the question is how do you do this? And the bigger the deploy you have, the bigger the, the, bigger the deploy you have, um, the harder it is, right? You know that, right? Um, that's how it goes. And if you're trying to do multi cloud, something that Liz referred to that in the past, that gets really tricky, really fast. Okay, so here's what I want to do I want to tell you about something I think that is potentially the answer to your problems. The problem with this is that the topic that I have to bring up is often sort of uh, associated with sleepy time. Okay, and I'm aware, based on the way you said look initially, that everybody's a little sleepy. Um, so I'm going to do my best to sort of keep you, uh, you know, engaged in this sort of stuff. The thing I want to talk about is this one little word here. And for those of you in the back, you know, do that. Does that help at all? Um, I want to talk a little bit about policy. The role that policy as a tool can have in a way to help to get open these sort of things. Now, when I say policy, the problem with it is, is that people start thinking about things like this. They start thinking about the CDP security policy and procedures handbook, which is a real, you know, you can't put it down once you start. That's really great. <laughs> uh, the handbook of physical policy, which, you know, I would recommend to play for the movie. And perhaps the human environment, you have an employee manual, which we've all read, and I go that we sit there like a hippo and recite each other, you know, because it's that good, right? All, all, all that thing. But the other thing that is, if you actually do a policy, right? Like, is your policy meetings? How many people here have had the pleasure of being in a policy meeting for their organization, company, etc.? Raise your hand, please. Yes, and it looks a little bit like this, right? Well, perhaps a little bit more like that. <laughs> is, that is that correct? Right? This is usually what goes on. But what I want to do is, I want to tell you, the policy can be a little sexier than that. Okay, this is this is my. Uh, graphic designer, not the uh, version of what the policy is. And you know, let me make it even sexier than that. Does that help you at all? Does that make it any sexier? <laughs> okay, I'll leave it like that. I'll let it go. Uh, so here's what I want to say about policy. To me, policy is kind of like 
this situation, like, let's say this is your environment, right? Your environment where you're open to you're driving down the road, right? This is your, your developers, you, you're all going to your obstacle driving down the road. Or maybe your environment looks a little bit more like this. Um, or uh, perhaps more like this. Or if you're like the environments that I work in, um, it's probably closer to that, <laughs> right? Now, one of the things that you may or not have paid attention to in all of these particular slides are these things over here. I'm kind of point to it, like that later. What are these called? Barriers. Barriers is one word. What's another word? Guardrails. Guardrails. Ding, 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 ding. You win. So here's the question. The question is, if you can somehow set up guardrails for the people using your systems, then what tends to happen is you set up these guardrails, and the people who want to use your systems can use your systems and go as fast as they want, get the access to the resources they need, do what they need to do, and you don't worry about it because they stay in the guardrails, right? So now what I want to do is I want to see if I can get you to sort of demand guardrails out of every single vendor that is here and that you engage with. I want to see if you can do this. Can somebody tell me where that slide is from? But louder, I'm hearing you, but I'm not hearing you well. Yes, it's from Young Frankenstein. This is why I love you people to get my references. Um, okay, so what I want you to do is, is what I want to do is get you in a situation where you're demanding because you run into these situations where it's super necessary. Like those situations where you know you have a developer who wakes up and it says, you know, it's 2 a.m. and my thing, my jobs aren't working particularly well. You know, I need I need memory. I need more memory. I need lots of Right? Or in a situation where there might be malware in a, doctor, in a public doctor image. Never happens, right? Uh, except though, if you bring the last time I checked in the Docker Hub, if you look at the MySQL, uh, the official MySQL one, you'll see it has shell shock in it. How about running that in production? You know? Uh, or how about the fact that you have one container over here and it's talking to some other container over there and you didn't expect it? Right? Like, what, what's going on there? And, uh, you know, I don't know what, what's the open SSL uh, exploit of the day. And does it have an adorable name, uh, which is you know meant to make you feel better about just what you're going to be spending your nights and days doing, you know, hashing it? Right? I'm so excited. Or uh, you know, you have a situation where somebody says, "Well, what version of Java are we running?" And you're like, "Wait, wait, is that old or is that new? I didn't realize that." Uh, or who has those database credentials? And what can those database credentials do? You know, if you don't know, it's, it's problematic. So the question that I would ask you uh, is, here is your policy now? in your environment. My experience is in one of two places. It's either in a situation where you have a department or a person who's in charge of compliance and policy, and they look a lot like someone from, from, you know, like when you first came to the country, and their job is to say no at the right time, right? Or all the time, it's hard to tell. But, but their job is to say no, right? And the positive thing about having a person like this, or, or I think about this, is it means that for sure nothing's going to get by and everything's going to be fully compliant and the problem with this is this is maximally frictional. Because what will happen is um, if every single thing has to go through a person, you probably don't have one person per request, and you're going to back it up, right? You have to do this mother may on thing. It's not the greatest thing. But on the other hand, what often happens is people do the opposite side of this, which is basically what happens when you know, anybody who has a credit card can provision, provision infrastructure, right? You have a wild, wild west situation where everybody does their own thing and we, right? But the problem with the Wild Wild West, for anybody who likes watching those movies, is invariably somebody takes a stray bullet, right, during the movie, right? And if, you know, there's a situation where the mine shaft collapses because somebody didn't, uh, somebody didn't put in the right, you know, uh, reinforcements. Or a situation where, right, you forgot to back that database up. You know, stuff like that. We're, you know, I didn't know you needed that data. You know, so this stuff happens. Now, what invariably happens also is if you have the first one, where you have the client officer sort of situation, what invariably happens in my experience is you get this sort of shadow IT thing, right? Where people are like, that's too hard. I'm not going to bother with them. I'm just going to get my own stuff. And then, congratulations, you have the best or the worst of both worlds, right? Because now you've got a situation where like, you have the, the official way and the non official way, and none of it is really together. So in the Wild Wild West, typically people have uh, their policy in their wikis, sometimes it's in their shell scripts, sometimes it's in Bob's head or Susan's head, right? And this is not who you really want this. Okay, so what would be better? What would be a better answer to this? By the way, this is a cosplay of this, that's why I show it to you versus having it come out with your uh, copyright. 
Uh, the best thing you would want in a policy situation is you want policy that's pervasive. It's not useful to you if it's not everywhere in your life, right? It's not the front of it. And you want to be explicit. You want to be able to say what you need in your policy. If it's, if it's not great early on, it's not going to do what you need. It's also super critical that it has to be automatically enforced. Having a policy where you know somebody has to say yes or no to things when they, when something comes in is not useful, right? It's, it goes back to the maximum restriction. You want it automatically enforced. You want the computer to do what the computer does well and the people to do what the people do. Uh, so let's talk about where you might want to put these sort of enforcement points that we're talking about. And I'm trying to give you some tips. So when you are building your own system or working on this new stuff. Do that. So an important one that you probably come up with immediately is resource limits, right? And basically, most systems have the ability to set resource limits, right? Because you want to be able to say how much memory am I going to use? How much do you? You might want to say how many of these jobs am I allowed to run? You know, for instance, stuff like that. You want object counts, you want template usage, stuff like that. So you really need this in your in your system for everything. But more interesting is you need to work out the workload to workload connection stuff that we were talking about. I'm using workload as a generic term just to make it easier. So I don't have to say containers and VMs or whatever else, you know, your metal, whatever you want. And so the thing to realize about this that's kind of important to realize is when you're coming up with policy for workloads and workload stuff, you really want it to take it down to the port level and the kind of and the kind of uh, protocol you're using. And the reason for that sort of stuff is you want to be able to say, um, and this is crucial because you don't want bi-directional trust. But most people do when they set up these things like this, they go, hey, machine A, the app server, can talk to the um, to the database server. And congratulations, they now have full connectivity between them. The problem with this situation is the first time somebody pops your database server and then uses it to attack your application server, you're sad. And the reason why they can do that is because you just said everybody can talk to each other. But really what you want to do is say, the application server can talk to the database server on the database port, and that's it. The database server can't talk to the application server, it doesn't need to, you know, besides sending information over a that connection to it. It has no need to talk to that, to that server. So you really want to build your stuff at this level of granularity. Um, it's obvious that you want to make sure that if you are that you can decide whether data can flow in or out of your workloads from the big bad internet or other things, it's super obvious. Um, you know, you might also want to say if you've got a bunch of workloads that move around, and let's say it's a web server, you might want to have it so that I can have a URL that follows you, that follows your workload around, right? Some sort of external router and you know, go follow that sort of stuff. Okay, that's a policy thing you can say, especially when it comes to multi cloud. If I'm going to say here's my workload, it's now running on Amazon, I want to take it down and bring it up, to bring it over to Amazon, and see it. Well, you know, you want to make sure that the URL follows. Point. Also super useful is the ability to say something about what versions to be running in your system, right? You want to be able to say things like, I only want Java 1.7, I don't want anything before then, or I'm currently running Java 1.7, and um, I want to make sure that anything that is lower than that, that is still running, continue running, but after that, like nothing can come in that's not 1.7. You want to be able to say stuff like that. You also probably want to say something about your deployment. Who is allowed to push stuff to production? Where is it allowed to come from? What is it allowed to contain? That sort of stuff is really important. Um, it is also strange and interesting that we don't spend a lot of time thinking about log access. Because if you have a situation where your developer comes to you and says, and says to you, you know, I am trying to debug my application, it does these database transactions, would you be so kind as to give me the database logs for my application? So you have a few choices. You can give her access on your database server, so she can look at the, the logs. Would you like this? Here you go. No. You can say, okay, here's a copy of your logs, right? Which is also problematic because they might want another copy. Uh, or you can do other. Or you can spit this stuff out to some other third party, being responsible for it, and you can do it that way. So you have to think ahead of time how you give access to the logs. To your logs. <coughs> Um, I would also suggest that it is important to be able to decide who is allowed to write and edit the policy. Because if everybody can do it, that's problematic. Um, and here's one of those places where I'm going to take one of these things away. Is that cool? Yes? My first one? Okay, you're going to be careful? Yes? Okay. Um, 
here's something that I think is kind of cool that we have to do. Um, one of the things we do in our system that I would love to see other people do, we allow you to do some cool management, well, they want me to say management, let me think of a better way to this. Uh, inline components, how's that? Where basically you have a situation where, let's say you've got an application and it's talking to a database. We can stick something in the middle if we want, and your application talks to it, and it talks to database. Now, the value of this is a fewfold. Number one, we can do these ephemeral credentials here, where basically your application gets these credentials that are used to talk to our thing in the middle, but aren't real. They don't really talk to the database, right? So if these credentials go wandering, it's not a problem, because they're only useful for that particular set of connections. Now it's a positive thing. The other thing we can do that's kind of fun is because we understand the wire protocols that go on with the database thing, is if your application says, drop a table, or anything else you don't want to do, we can just drop that request on the floor. So if your application decides to get a little happy and do some damage, you can sort of contain that if you have something in the middle. Or for fun, you can do something like latency monkey, where you can, you can insert artificial latency in. What does my application do if I have latency, if I have more latency, if the, if the database is slow, that I can slow the database. So there's a lot of cool stuff you can do if you can control what goes on in your, in your system between things that are popular. Okay. So the question is, what did I leave out on the policy? I'm going to freak you out. You can be okay with this, but I'm about to do it right now. Don't let this bug you. But we are going to edit the slide together. Right? What did I leave out? What else do you need in a policy system that you think you might want? It's important. Please raise your hand. And I've got plenty of time, so I can I can I pull it off the silences. Yes, sir. Audit trails. You need audit trails. Good. I like that. Next. Would you like five maybe? I know you know this. Yes, sir. Ability to change it without breaking everything. Okay, so let me see if I write that. I'm gonna read exactly what I said. Ability to change things without breaking. So perhaps you need a dry run mode, that sort of thing, at the very least, with something along the lines like what is this gonna do? Yes, sir. You actually have to do it. You actually have to do it. I need more, I need you to help you with that. By the way, sorry, I want to make sure what he's saying. I'm not sure what you're saying. Yes, sir. I think the tendency is to have conversation about Okay, so you see. Is that one for you? Is that a good one? Oops, I think maybe type. Uh, okay. Next, please. You got two more. Right. Yes, please. Centralized what? Up to what? what? Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with that. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, access to monitoring. Access to monitoring. You want to say a little bit more about that? Because I like that a lot. I want to hear what you have to say. Um, some people have our organization where they see the monitoring page that I look at. Um, they check out because they just think it's orange right now. It's not green, everything else is green, and then they come and they freak out, or they have to like change things. It's like, no, I'm just in this thing. So I'm going to summarize that. I'm going to summarize that as we need to have broad access, to, broad access to monitoring around this sort of stuff. I agree with that totally. Hey, I'm going to take one more, and then we'll move on, and then you can tell me after that the clock. I'm going to take the four other things in the clock. In a policy system, what do you want? All the way in the back. Yeah, let's do it. It's like an auction. You get to be right back to bid. Yeah, we're a root cause, like a root cause analysis. You want to do the root cause analysis? Now, it's the root cause analysis. Say, so root cause analysis is coming in. Okay. Okay, so the only thing that I want to mention that I didn't mention in my other slides that are super important to have in a policy is I think it's really important that you have audit trails, 
definitely needs the ability to change things without breaking everything. It's pretty crucial to be able to have some sort of follow through. Uh, if you have, don't have credential control, this thing will not work. It just will not work. Uh, access to monitoring is very key so other people understand what's going on. And a little bit of root cause analysis really helps. Okay, what others? So rather than just sort of leave you hanging with like, where are you going to find this stuff, right? Someone pointing? So uh, I'm going to give you some idea about where you can find the level of policy that I'm talking about. Uh, but I might make you a little sad, and I apologize for that. Uh, you're probably not going to find it in with for cloud providers. It is the case that Amazon is ahead of this in terms of being able to have some level of policies that where you could say, okay, this person can spin up this size, uh, this size, and you see two misses and stuff like that. But it's not at the level of granularity that we're talking at today. Um, with Azure, they once upon a time had, and I think they're getting a little bit better, role-based access control that had three roles. And if you wanted another kind of role, we have three roles. And if you really think it's important that for your organization, if you have uh, more granular roles, you can have one of our three roles. Um, and that was the case. It's a little bit better now, I believe. Uh, Google Compute Engine also will give you some help. This was their stuff in their doc. Uh, if team members have better nutrition and they can modify instances and also access instances using SSH, if team members are authorized as an owner, they are also able to create Google Compute Engine resources in the project. I hope it's better now. I really hope it was better since I made this slide. And um, anybody here have the pleasure of working with software? Yeah, so there's a couple of, there's a few people having the pleasure working with software. Software uh, has, but when I contacted your support and said, where can I find policy in your system? Where can I get the things I need? Uh, they said, well, you can, you can use any of the policy that's available in, in our GUI, in our, in our web interface. Go ahead and do that. And so I logged in, and I used the thing, and I counted there were some 73 odd uh, checkboxes. I'm like, ah, but not, but none of them you wanted. That was the problem. But this may, maybe those will work with software. Uh, Okay, so maybe it's in your platform, right? Um, hopefully, you know, so this is this is uh, the fine folks from Mesosphere. You can correct me if I'm wrong. I looked just last night. I googled policy Mesos, and I didn't find anything. Still, there's still authentication and authorization, but not all frameworks play nice. Um, so if there's better, let me know. That's awesome. Uh, these folks over here uh, are working on it, right? This you know what this is. So I should just ask you what the logos are. Yes. Oh, great. So OpenStack, once upon a time, came up with something called Congress. And Congress is meant to be a, a generic policy engine, and the way it works is you feed all the data from your system into Congress, and Congress will tell you whether, you made it, whether something, have, something has been, whether a policy has been violated. Right? Which is a little bit, you know, it's kind of like what happens with the police. You know, the police aren't staying are waiting to, to help with enforcement all the time. You have to go to them and say there was a crime. But, and then they're supposed to sort of mitigate that, right? But this is not, to my mind, the thing you want to apply this. And maybe Congress can tell you, I don't know. Um, our iCloud friends um, from Kubernetes um, are getting there closer. You know, they have, you know, resource quotas and stuff like that. It's an ingress policy now. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm going to take one away. Um, we do this really well. It's one of the things that we hear a lot about, as you probably guess. So if you want to check this out, you should check it out. Okay, so here's my end thing. What I'm hoping to do is give you your own set of pitchforks and torches so that you can take them and go to every single of your vendors and demand this level of policy from them. Right? If they don't have it, uh, don't let them on fire. But you know, just suggest to them that they really need to have it right now. And with that, I'm going to come to, oh, I'm sorry, I should mention, uh, because I work in DevOps, I actually haven't done a lot just in case. Uh, <laughs> anyway. So, I want to thank you all for your time and your patience. I really appreciate the chance to talk and thank you to the organizers. Thank you very much.